action from, whereas in Surat al-Nas, it is just one evil. Uh, and what, what are these? Let us look first at Surat al-Falaq. Uh, what, uh, what, what is the evil? Actually, uh, before we go into the evil itself, uh, Allah mentions himself as Rabb al-Falaq, Lord of al-Falaq. Uh, commonly translated as daybreak, and of course this is one meaning of the word, or, or, or one understanding of the word. But the uh, root meaning of the word is to split. Uh, splitting. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself uh, as Faliq uh, al wa nawa Faliq. From the same root of Falaq. Inna laha Faliq al wa nawa he is the one who splits the grain and the, the fruit stone, meaning the seed in the fruit. The seed from the fruit. Now when these things split, when the grain splits, and when the seed of a fruit splits, especially of course it is in the ground, what happens? You know, this happens first of all because it, um, there are things that are happening inside of the grain and inside of the, uh, the fruit seed. Uh, and we don't see it until it begins to split and then we see something emerging from it. What is that? The plant that emerges from it that eventually will go grow you know, into a full-fledged uh, tree perhaps and bear fruits and so on. Uh, or the plants that will give the, uh, the vegetables uh, 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 various types of vegetations. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who splits these things. So it is actually splitting and emerging. Falak is not just splitting, but splitting and emerging. When something splits, something emerges from it. <coughs> when the seed splits, the, uh, the plant emerges from it, it eventually grows into a tree. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned just in the verse after that, this is in Surah Al-An'am, uh, mentions himself as Falik al-Isbah. Falik al-Isbah, uh, he is the one who splits the morning. He is the one who causes the, the morning to emerge. Uh, and so this has this is more perhaps related to Falak in the sense of daybreak. When the dawn comes, uh, the night is split. Uh, when you see the night splitting, you see the rays of the sun coming through them. That is how it splits, right? That is, uh, uh, that, is that phenomenon that happens. Uh, and what emerges from that is the day the light, the brightness and so on that emerges from it. And this is a thing that happens, uh, how often does it happen? Of course, daybreak only happens once in, in, in any particular area of the earth. However, it is a phenomenon that is constantly happening. At every moment, every second, there is daybreak that is occurring in some part of the world. Uh, so it's a continuous uh, phenomenon. But it is also that phenomenon, the splitting, in a general, more general sense, uh, is what brings things to life. Or what brings things to light. The two things, what brings things to light, it was, hidden, it was hidden before, and then when that splitting occurs and the emerging occurs, then we see things which we had not seen before. And it brings things to life, that is how life comes. Uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala splits the grain and he splits uh, the, the, the fruit seed and so on. So, uh, but the splitting uh, can also be looked at in a figurative way, not just physically what we see around us in the universe, but also uh, in another way. In fact, the, the wounds, when it splits, what emerges, the child emerges from that. Right? The womb splits and the child emerges, uh, which you are not seeing before that. But also in a figurative way, uh, uh, the ideas, ideas come to light which were perhaps hidden. They were in the darkness before that. And then the darkness splits in a figurative way, in a symbolic way. It splits open and then what emerges? The ideas emerge. And this is something that is a phenomenon among human beings uh, throughout the age. At all times, this, this is happening too. The ideas that are emerging from people, from human beings and so on, right? Uh, that are coming to light. And some of them good and some of them bad. Some of them very corrupt. Uh, and perhaps this is where the, we have also symbolically the idea of darkness. 
when we are in darkness, they're discovering everything in corruption and so on. They're discovering everything. We are not seeing what is happening underneath. And then suddenly everything is split, uh, and there emerges uh, the things that were hidden. The, these things come to light now, uh, and perhaps the, uh, the influence in society is so great that these things begin to change. Whatever was, um, if, if there were bad things, or corruption that's all happening in the society, perhaps uh, the light that comes now uh, brings something positive, a positive change to the society. And I think you are seeing this phenomenon now, and for the last few years, what has been happening in the Middle East, you know, the corruption that has been there, the suppression, uh, the dictatorship and so on, the suppression of the people and so on. And what is coming to light now is something that did not start now. It started years ago, and uh, has germinated to this extent where now it is coming out into the open started to come out a few years ago and then there's, there's coming out again with another force, right? What is happening in Iraq and uh, in Lebanon and so on. People who are rejecting the dictatorship and the suppression and corruption and so on of the, uh, of, of the leaders. So maybe we'll be seeing good things uh, soon, inshallah. <coughs> Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord of this phenomenon. Uh, and after that Allah mentions in the surah uh, the various, various evils or sources of evil uh, including first of all generally that is general from the evil of what he has created and then more specifically the evil of the darkness when it gathers. Uh, and darkness can be symbolic also, it can be the real darkness uh, and we do have fear of it and there are things that can happen in the darkness and so on we seek Allah's protection from those things, those evils that can happen there uh, but also darkness can be symbolic <coughs> corruption is a form of darkness uh, the dictatorship, the brutal dictatorship that was there and that continues to be there in various parts of the world uh, that is a form of darkness. Sins uh, are a, a form of darkness. Uh, uh, and the various other deviations of mankind from the true path and so on, they are for forms of darkness. Uh, sin, uh, any, any form of sin and so on, it's a type of darkness. Uh, so we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from darkness, whatever form and shape it may take. Uh, because he is the one who brings the light. He is the one who splits open his darknesses and brings out from them uh, the goodness. <clears throat> we, we cannot, of course, spend too long uh, on uh, any of these ayat of the Quran, but they have very, very deep meaning, uh, which we need to reflect on. Uh, the evil of blowers and the literal translation, uh, those who blow upon not, and nafatha, not, and nafathat he feel okay. And nafathat, uh, uh, it is the feminine plural. Uh, so usually, uh, Mufassirin have explained it to mean the women who uh, do sorcery or who do black magic and so on, right? The witches, who we call witches. So the, from the evil of the conjuring witches uh, uh, and the way that they used to do black magic. Uh, uh, in, uh, in those days, in the days of their Prophet وسلم, in the Arabian Peninsula is that perhaps they would tie knots and they would blow upon them uh, to cause a harmful effect upon people. And this was done against the Prophet وسلم, himself as reported by, by a Jew. <coughs> uh, but is this ayah only talking about, first of all, women and only talking about black magic. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the feminine plural does not only refer to females, does not necessarily refer to females. Uh, in the Arabic language, the feminine plural is used for other things also, not just uh, f f uh, human beings who are females, but uh, for things also, other things. Uh, so uh, it can refer to nafs, uh, nafs, nafs, 
meaning the self or soul, and the plural, nofos, uh, and so you can have, it is, uh, uh, you can use a feminine plural pronoun to refer to that, uh, and nofos and nafathad, the souls are individuals who blow, who do, who, pra who make the, who practice these things, the blowing up on nuts, who practice witchcraft. Uh, jama'a, the word jama'a means a group of people and the plural also jama'at and the, the adjective can be used, this adjective can be used to refer to that also jama'at nafasa, groups of people who blow into nuts doing witchcraft against others so witchcraft is something that can be, can be done by male as well as females uh, as well as individuals, as well as groups. So it is not just women who practice witchcraft. It, men can, in fact, what we see in the Sira, the person who did witchcraft against the Prophet ﷺ was a man, not a woman. So why the, is this word used here? Because it is re perhaps referring to individuals, any individual, they are not the fools who does this act, whether male or female, or even groups of people if they come together to do this act against others. So that is one thing uh, that we need to look at and we need to understand. Not even, in fact, both, most of the people perhaps who practice the black arts are men and not women. <laughs> so why is the feminine plural used? is not referring to women alone, it is referring to anyone, right, who practices it. So that is one thing. Uh, the next thing we have to look at is, Allah says that, uh, actually describes them how anafasati uh, fil they blow upon or into knots. Oqan, oqan, they blow into knots. So most of the Mufassirin have given us that description of how they practice black, the black arts by tying knots and blowing into them. <coughs> But is that the only meaning that we get from it? No, that is not the only meaning. Uh, the word okad, not, is the plural of the word okda. Okda is the singular, a not. And this word is used in other places of the Quran. And so when we look at other parts of the Quran, uh, we can have, perhaps have a better understanding of how it is used here. Uh, how is the word okda used? Not just physical knots. Uh, that you may tie in, in a piece of cloth or so, on, or on a rope or so, right? Not only those kind of knots. Musa alayhi salam, uh, when Allah said, um, you made him a prophet and he made dua to Allah, he said, Wahlul uqdatam min lisani. Wahlul uqdat. Uqdatam min lisani. What's the meaning of that? Loosen a knot from my tongue. That is not a physical knot, right? Something tied physically on his tongue. No, it is not referring to that. What he is talking about is his inability to express himself, right? That's a knot that he had. And you, even in English, we say that if a person uh, cannot express himself well, uh, he has a knot on his tongue. Right? He cannot <laughs> express himself well. He has a knot. His tongue is tied. His tongue is tied. That is what, that's how we say it, right? Uh, so this is uh, not a physical knot, it's uh, uh, in a figurative uh, way of speaking. There's a knot uh, uh, in my tongue. Uh, and that means also a complication. A okta can refer to a complication, a difficulty. And do we have all sorts of di different difficulties? Yes, we have all sorts of difficulties. Uh, if you encounter a difficulty in your job, you're know, trying to do your job, you can refer to that as okda. You know, I, I, I've reached this knot here that I cannot untie. You know, I cannot solve this problem. This is a problem I cannot solve. Right? To refer to problems as okad, as knots. And we encounter that all the time in our lives, right? So whether it's in our job or in, in various situations, even in our relationship with, with one another, 
relationships are also up there. There are ties that we have with one another, knots that we have with one another. And when there are complications in that relationship, uh, it is another kind of tie, a knot, a complication in the relationship. So the relationship itself can be called Uqda between two individuals. Allah says, Uqda tun nikah, Uqda tun nikah, the tie of what? A marriage. Right? So a husband and wife have that tie with them, that's a good tie, something positive. But when problems start to occur in it, that those problems can also be referred to as Uqad, right? Uqda. Not the complications arising in, a, in our relationship. And so, uh, what about this blowing upon knots? If you look at knots uh, in all of these sense, different senses, uh, and I'm not saying anything out of the Quran, this is how Allah uses the word Uqda in the Quran itself. Right? And here in this ayah, those who blow upon knots. And if you look at the word knots figuratively, people blowing up on knots, that can also be the entire phrase. It can be figurative too. Not, um, not that there's a real knot and they're actually blowing with their mouths or on the knot, like how the, the, those who practice witchcraft might be doing. Uh, but somebody who blows into a relationship if there's a good relationship, husband-wife relationship, which is supposed to be good, right? And somebody comes and blows into that relationship, what is he doing? He is, he is trying to split them apart, right? He is creating problems for them. So in a figurative way, we say he is blowing into that relationship, into that knot. <clears throat> and similarly, if there is already a complication, and something, we have, we have a knot, we have a problem, uh, we have a difficulty that we are uh, experiencing. <clears throat> and somebody comes and blows into that difficulty, blows into that problem, what does it mean? It means that he is trying to complicate it further. Right? Just like how somebody uh, blows into fire and what happens? It blazes more or the wind comes. Uh, and you know, uh, blows into the fire, and what happens? It spreads more. The, sp the fire spreads more. You know, uh, and we do this all the time, right? When our fire is going down, we blow into it. We put more fuel into it, or, or firewood, and so on, and we blow into it so that it can catch back. Uh, the flames can arise again, and so on, right? So we blow physically into the fire to make it become bigger. So similarly, if a person blows into a problem, he is trying to make it bigger. <coughs> and well, in, in this surah, we are seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from all of these evils. <laughs> this is an evil. Uh, and you know, from Though for, from those who are trying to make complicated things more complicated, now if there is a good situation and uh, an envy occurs, right? So somebody sees you enjoying something and he begins to envy you, evil will, can come out of that also, right? So from a bad situation that people try to make worse by blowing into it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us also that there is this kind of evil if there is a good situation there, uh, envy can step in and, uh, and cause a problem here, right? People, because of their envy for you, of the, because of the goodness that you have, the good things that you're enjoying and so on, can make life complicated for you. So we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from that type of evil also. That is sort of the falak in a very brief way. As I said, we can't go into uh, you know, too, much, too many details, right? Trying to come uh, to, to, to finish, the, to give you just a glimpse of what the surah, these surahs really come contain uh, in a short period of time. And so now we will look at surah al-Nas, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself as having 
this relationship with human beings. He is Rabb uh, al-Nas, uh, Malik uh, al-Nas, Ilah al-Nas, right? And so because he has this relationship with us, we should seek refuge in him from what? Here, one evil is mentioned, or one source of evil. And what is that? Al-Waswas al-Khannas. And we know that it's referring to Shaitan. But there are two descriptions here of that individual of Shaitan. Uh, what are those two descriptions? Al-Waswas, the whisperer, the one who whispers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him to us so we can understand who he is and how he operates. He doesn't come out in, in, into the open and tells, and tells you to do evil openly. Sometimes he does. But most of the times he whispers, right? This is uh, his main trait, his main characteristic. That he whispers, he comes secretly to you and he whispers. And al uh, and various translations of it, um, one, uh, one translation says you know, the retreating whisperer, the other says the sneaking whisperer. Yusuf Ali says uh, the whisperer who withdraws after his whisper. So he whispers and then he withdraws. So this is how shaitan operates also. Khannas means what comes and, uh, and, and retreats. Comes forward and then retreats. So he come for, comes forward, gives you his, his evil suggestion and then he retreats. This is uh, the characteristic of shaitan. He doesn't stay. He tries to keep himself invisible to you, right? Uh, not noticed by you. So he comes and whispers and in a soft way, in a, a way that you may not be able to detect uh, his presence, right? He just whispers and then he withdraws. But also, uh, one of the reasons for his withdrawal is when he uh, when he encounters opposition, uh, the resistance against his whispering. And how does that happen? Uh, if we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we mention the name of Allah, uh, we do dhikr, we say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al rajim he will withdraw. He will retreat. So he comes forward when he sees an opening for him, and he whispers and he tries to do as much mischief as he can, but when he, reach, when he encounters resistance, and especially by the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he retreats. So he comes forward and he retreats. So he is al-waswas al-khannas, the whisperer who retreats whenever he encounters a difficulty. He doesn't stay. And you know, there's a hadith that illustrates this very, in, a, in a very nice way. Uh, it says that shaitan comes uh, you know, he's whispering uh, to you and so on. Uh, and um, when the adhan is called, the adhan is dhikr, right? Uh, so when the adhan is called, he runs away. As far as he can, so he can't hear the adhan again. He runs away very far. Uh, but when the adhan is finished, he, uh, and, you know, and he, is, he is farting, to use the term, right? Uh, he is passing wind. When he runs away from the Adhan, he is passing wind. This is how much he hates the Adhan and the Dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when the Adhan is finished, he comes back. And when you are in your Salah, he tries to disturb you in your Salah and so on. So it's a very appropriate description of who Shaitan is. He runs away when there is the Dhikr, he retreats. And when the, you, you stop doing the Dhikr, you know, he comes back to you. And, uh, and uh, tries to get you to think of all sorts of things other than your salah. So, uh, we are seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is our sole protector, uh, the one whom we, uh, we ask for refuge and so on from uh, this evil personality. Now, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this surah also makes it, makes it plain to us that the shaitan is not just from the jinns, but he is also from human beings. Min al jinnati wal nas. Min al jinnati wal nas. Jinns as well as human beings. Uh, so uh, we should not think that this kind of whispering will not come from human beings. The whispering and suggesting of evil comes from human beings. 
now in our society here today, what is it, you know, the things that we are battling with? We as Muslims, there are things that we are battling with. Uh, and our children are exposed to, and especially when they go into high school, and when they go into college, uh, and they go into the workplaces and so on, and they are interacting with others in the society, they will encounter what situations they encounter. Uh, attacks on our aqidah. There is a lot of atheism that is widespread in the society today. And they will feel that pressure on them. The attacks of atheism or the atheists. Uh, there is Christian evangelism. Christians who are out, uh, you know, coming with their false doctrines and so on. Uh, trying to you know, attract people to themselves. Uh, and uh, there are things like Satanism. Satanism is the worship of Satan, which is prevalent in this society. People who <coughs> actually worship Satan. And at colleges and so on, they are inviting people, they are inviting other students to join them, to join their ranks. And there is uh, what you call hedonism. Hedonism. What is hedonism? It is pleasure seeking. Pleasure seeking. And you find a lot of that on campus also, on the university campuses, the colleges. And there are those who will invite their friends and their colleagues and, you know, in the classes and so on, they will invite them to come. Just for the pleasure of it. Just for pleasure. You know, and all of these, um, what they call, you know, the Greek fraternities, uh, the, uh, they have been, you know, in, their, in recent times they have been found, found guilty of doing all sorts of you know, corrupt things that many of them have been closed down in various uh, university campuses. They have been closed down because of the, uh, the corrupt things that they have been doing. So pleasure, whether, uh, and, uh, and that includes you know, lesbianism and homosexuality and, you know, all the various forms and, and, and so on, all sorts of corruption, right? People who are actively inviting others to join their group in these matters uh, uh, and just to enjoy life like that in these uh, corrupt pleasures. Right? Sometimes they come in a very subtle way, just like shaitan. They come and they whisper these things to you. And if a person is not strong in his aqidah, he will be influenced by them. And then also there are those who come and they maybe openly attack Islam and Islamic teachings. And sometimes not so openly, very subtly, uh, as if they are whispering to you. And whispering, of course, is not just you know, the, the physical act of whispering, but you know, in a subtle way coming to you in a subtle way, trying to undermine your belief and your practices in Islam. So, there are those who attack the foundations of Islam, the Prophet wasallam, the Quran, and so on and so forth. There are those who attack uh, various aspects of Islamic law, and they say that these laws are not correct, they have not come from Allah, and so on. There are those who, for example, attack the hijab, and uh, most Muslim women in particular are bombarded by that all the time. This hijab, where does it come from? This is suppression of women and, uh, and so on and so forth. They attack Islamic history uh, and they accuse Muslims of terrorism and so on and so forth, right? So in a wide variety of ways, Islam is under attack. A lot of it subtle, but a lot of it also not so subtle. Still, it is the whispering of shaitan. Uh, because uh, when, you, when, when that idea is implanted into your head, it is difficult to get rid of it, right? And it may become worse and worse, bigger and bigger in your head until you eventually give up your, your Islamic practices. Uh, and if our own children are not, you know, uh, they, they don't have a solid foundation in Islam, what is going to happen to them? Uh, you know, when these things uh, work upon them, if, if their own friends, in their, in their classrooms and their classmates are coming to them with these things and telling them all of these things. Why do you have to pray? Why are you wearing a hijab? Why are you, well, well, all of these things don't make sense, you know, they're not needed and so on. Just give up all of these things and come and enjoy yourself. 
so what is going to happen to our children if they are not you know, uh, sufficiently immunized against uh, that sort of thing, right? They will su succumb to it. And maybe you don't realize that because they're not coming home and telling you that. Right? All of that is happening on the campus out there and they're battling with these things in their minds and so on and they're not telling you any of it, any of the problems and the frustrations and so on that they have until maybe it is too late and then you see. So, <clears throat> Uh, this surah, surah to Nas, and both both surah to Quran are very, re very relevant for what is happening today. Of course, the only protection is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He protects whomsoever when He wants. There are those who will come to, they are ex-Muslims today, I don't know if you've heard, heard of them, right? Ex-Muslims, people who were Muslims, they are no longer Muslims. Uh, and they come, uh, 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 and they, uh, they will have a greater influence upon uh, the young Muslims, right? And this is who they try to approach. They try to approach the young Muslims on the campuses and, tell, and try to tell them, sometimes in a direct way, that Islam is false. I was a Muslim and I gave up Islam because I saw that it was false. And they will argue, uh, whether it is about uh, Allah, you know, and all of the attributes of Allah that are mentioned in the Quran and so on, and then about the laws of Islam and uh, about the prophets and so on, about every aspect of Islam. Uh, maybe if a, if a non-Muslim says those things, you are not so hurt, right? Um, uh, and maybe it doesn't have such an impact upon you. But when these doubts are, uh, are raised by ex-Muslim people who were Muslims, it may have a greater influence upon the, the Muslim youth. Uh, it will also perhaps have a greater uh, effect upon non-Muslims whom, whom you are trying to explain Islam to. You're trying to explain Islam to them and an ex-Muslim comes and tell, tells, you, tells him, don't listen to that person. I was a Muslim uh, and I gave up Islam because I saw that it was false. Right? So, <clears throat> the waswasa that comes from other human beings is tremendous, perhaps even more so than the jinns themselves. Now what is coming from the jinns? The waswasa that is coming from human beings can be worse. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Uh, so there are deeper meanings uh, to these uh, two surahs uh, that we need to think about uh, uh, and we need to understand that they are relevant. Uh, to what is happening all around us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. You said that Shaitan runs away when Adhan, he called and comes back to him to perform prayer. Yes. So prayer itself is the zikr. Yes. So why does Shaitan come back? Does he still continue the zikr? Uh, yes, uh, but he is trying, uh, he is trying to get us not to uh, continue the zikr, right? He's trying to get us uh, to, uh, he's get, trying to get our minds uh, to think of other things. Uh, so we might be performing the actions, you know, the, uh, uh, the salah is such that uh, there are actions involved and then there is the zikr itself, uh, the things that we say in the salah, and if we are thinking of what we are saying, uh, then we are actually involved in the zikr. But just doing the actions alone uh, is, is not thicker, right? So shaitan comes to, uh, to get our minds to go elsewhere, to think of other things, rather than, than to think about what we are actually saying in the salah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, has given him various opportunities uh, to lead people astray, right? So, uh, and... Uh, while he hates it uh, so much, right, that he runs away from the Adan, uh, Shaitan can also, you know, he, uh, he has a, an amount of resistance against these things. Uh, just like a human being may have a resistance against uh, certain things, right? Uh, he may be able to put up with noise, for example, up to a certain level, right? He doesn't like it. 
if a person doesn't like noise, right, and generally, of course, we don't like noise, we can put up with it to a certain level. Maybe when it goes beyond that, then we have to move away from that situation, right? So Shaitan will take that kind of punishment because he wants to lead people astray. He will endure that difficulty that he has with the thicker until he can get somebody to completely forget about the thicker, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is how we are, uh, and when, uh, when, you know, when we talk about possession, you know, the cases of possession, uh, when a jinn possesses a human being, it is a dhikr that will remove uh, the jinn from that situation. Uh, however, the jinn uh, may resist it up to a point. You recite Quran, you do all of the azkar that you know, and the jinn is still there haunting that individual, right? Because they can take punishment just as human beings. We can, we can take pain to a great extent, you know, up to a certain limit. If we think that, and especially if we think that we're going to be able to achieve our objective if we take that pain, right? So the same for the jinn. They might endure the pain that they get from the dhikr of Allah because they have an objective in mind. Right? But when it gets too great for them, that is when they have to give up. Again, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaha.